Well, hello. Welcome back to Principles of Accounting 2. I am your host, Dr. B. Uh, and today we're going to talk about the foundations of everything about Principles of Accounting 2. The managerial accounting concepts and principles. This is what Accounting pr Principles 2 is all about. Uh, we are going to be talking a, a lot about in this course about things like cost, budgeting, analyzing the costs, making decisions. These are all the concepts that we're going to be talking about throughout the next six weeks. And so, uh, without further ado, let's talk about what is a managerial accounting. What is it? What is it all about? What is this course? all about what do i need to know about this course what do i need to know about making decisions for my company okay when we talk about cost in this course we're going to talk about manufacturing concepts if you think about a product any product there's a lot of effort that goes into making that product. For example, uh, let's think about this. We all have one of these, I think. For the most part, we all have one of these. This is a cell phone, okay? This is a cell phone. Now this cell phone, there's a lot that go on into making this phone. We had raw materials, we had a work in process. We had done the finished good. But most importantly, we had people make these things, the phone. Okay. So we have materials, we have people, and we have a place where it was made. There's a lot of cost that went into this phone. It cost a lot of materials, and labor and overhead there are three costs that go into making anything there's raw materials there's labor and there's overhead those are the cost of making a product it sounds simple it's not but we're going to talk about manufacturing we're going to talk about the cost associated with making a product we're going to talk about the inventory that's involved. We're going to talk about cost of goods sold and things like that. So I want you to get into the mindset in this course from a manufacturing perspective. Think about making a product. What goes into it? And that's how we'll better understand the concepts of managerial accounting so first what is this course all about what is managerial accounting accounting uh, managers use accounting information financial inf and non-financial information to make decisions it's simple very simply what it means managers use financial and non-financial information to make decisions that's managerial accounting what I mean by that is we use what's called the balance scorecard approach. We look at things like cost, that's financial. We look at things like uh, revenue, that's financial. We look at customer satisfaction, that's non-financial. We look at things like the number of customer complaints, that's non-financial. We look at the number of employees who called out sick, that's non-financial. But we take all this type of information, we analyze it, and we make decisions. That's what managerial accounting is all about. We look at everything, and we look at it from an internal perspective. We don't take into consideration the stuff that gets published. 
We look at the stuff that's internal to the company. Managerial. Why do managers look at this kind of information? Well, it's a cycle. We call this the managerial cycle. We plan to make new products, go into new markets, build new factories. These are the things that we want to do in the business. We want to grow the business. How do you grow the business? Make new products, go into new places, build new factories, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we do this. The next thing we need to do is control it. How do we control costs? How do we get to profitability? Are my customers happy? And then we monitor it. We control it. We get feedback. We plan. We monitor. We control. We get feedback. It's a cycle. It's the managerial cycle, really. You know, these, that's how companies improve. Otherwise, nothing would change, right? It's like nothing would ever improve. Nothing would be different because this process wouldn't be in place. So that, that's why managerial accounting exists. Uh, we talked about this briefly in the, in the last uh, chapter, the differences between financial and managerial accounting. Financial accounting, principles one, we dealt with the external users, investors, creditors, the government, uh, creditors, uh, banks, um, everyone outside the company. Those are external users, and it helps them to make the it helps them to make decisions. It's structured. It's structured and controlled by generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, we do it yearly. The information is based off of the previous inf year's information. It focuses on the entire company as a whole, and it's monetary in nature. Right? That's all financial accounting. That was all principles of accounting one. Principles of accounting two focuses on managerial accounting. Now we're looking at internal users of information. The managers, the employees, the board of directors, other internal stakeholders, people inside the company. And they use the information to plan and control and make better decisions. The good news is with these kind of reports that we generate internally is that they're flexible. They don't have to adhere to generally accepted accounting principles because they're not published. We're not going to make our budget known to the whole world okay we're not going to tell them what our product costs are that's all internal information that's what gives us a competitive advantage companies are not required to publish their budget or their costs they don't publish that stuff they're not going to go tell their competitors this is how much i paid for this inventory no <laughs> don't do that you know that, that's all internal stuff that's all internal reports information is made available when we need it we, can, we use it to make future decisions and estimates on projects etc and it focuses on the company as a whole and parts of the company and the visions and it's really flexible uh, but I also consider things that are monetary and non-monetary in decision making, like customer satisfaction, you know, costs, etc. So that's what managerial accounting focuses on. Of course, everything we do is ethical in accounting. You should hopefully know that by now. Uh, we try to be as transparent as possible. Oftentimes, our stuff is audited. Uh, we do our best to protect our assets from theft, from shrinkage, uh, from uh, you name it, right? Things happen to our assets. We've got, we got to protect them. We uphold company policies, promote efficient operations. All these things help to ensure 
that the company is, eth is acting ethically and is doing their best to prevent any type of fraud or any misuse of accounting information. In managerial accounting, it's different than financial accounting. There's a lot of different careers in managerial accounting. Chief financial officer, controller. That's what I used to be. I used to be a controller. I didn't make that kind of money, <laughs> but uh, oh yeah, I used to be a financial controller back in the day. General manager. I was one of those for a little while too. Division controller. Financial analyst, senior accountant, staff accountant, all awesome jobs. There are so many careers in accounting. It's unbelievable how, how big accounting is. Why? Because every single company has it. Every government organization has it. Every nonprofit has it. Everything has it. <laughs> if it's a business, it has accounting. It has to, otherwise it wouldn't exist. So that's why they say, remember, like we, well, the first day of Principles 1, we talked about the language of business. We used to call accounting the language of business. It's because it is. It's the language of business, right? A lot of jobs, a lot of jobs in the industry. A lot of career paths uh, everywhere. And the pay is decent. Not great, but it's not bad. Okay, cost. <clears throat> this is the important stuff, okay? Cost. I'm going to talk a lot about cost in this course. And you guys will have to forgive my New York accent. It sounds like cost. Cost. I'm still working on it, you know? Cost. C O S T. Cost. A lot of cost, okay? In the, in accounting, we're going to talk about the two types of cost, really. There are what we call fixed costs and variable costs. Fixed costs are fixed. They don't change. They don't change, regardless of the level of activity. What I mean by that is, if we produce more or we produce less, the cost is the same. That's a fixed cost. A couple of examples. Supervisor's salary. That's a fixed cost. That person gets paid the same amount regardless of how much they produce or don't produce. Rent for the building stays the same regardless of how much we make or don't make. Fixed cost. Any other, uh, what else do you all think? What else is a fixed cost? Don't all answer at once. What's a, what, what else do you think is a fixed cost? Doesn't change over time. We talked about rent, talked about supervisor salaries. What else? Else does not change over time. Cost remains the same. Mortgage, yeah, that's one. Uh, anything that's consistent, right? Then we have variable costs. Any examples of variable costs? What are costs that change like month to month? Costs that change month to month. Any examples? Utilities. Yeah, utilities change month to month. The electric goes up and down, right? Electric bill is different every month. Uh, the um, hourly wages, so direct labor, that's a variable cost. Direct materials, that's a variable cost. The amount of materials I put into producing a product, absolutely. 
Yeah, these are all examples of variable costs. Costs that change with the level of activity. The more I produce, the higher my electric bill is, the higher my direct labor is, the higher my direct materials are. And the opposite is also true. If I produce less, the lower those types of costs are. They change with the level of activity. We call this variable cost. Okay, you heard me say the word direct. Direct cost. A direct cost is a cost I can trace directly to a product. Or we call it a cost object. Direct labor and direct materials are two perfect examples of direct costs. Direct labor is what direct, well, let's we'll start with direct materials. Earlier, I gave the example of this cell phone, okay? This cell phone has direct materials and direct labor to make the phone. Direct materials. These are the costs of the materials that make up the majority of the product. For the cell phone, most of it's made out of plastic and precious metals. Plastic and precious metals and some glass. Those are direct materials. They make up the majority of the cost of the materials inside the phone. Direct materials. When you hear direct materials, it makes up the majority of the cost of making that product. The other cost is direct labor. Direct labor is the hourly labor cost of the employees that are making the product, physically making the product. There's a lot of people that made this phone. It went on what we call an assembly line. It comes down the assembly line. There are people working directly on the assembly line. That's called direct labor. Their hourly wages can be traced directly to the manufacturing of this phone. Think of like a car, okay? Here's another, another example would be a car. Think of an assembly line. The car starts off as raw materials in a lumber yard, okay, outside the factory. Outside the factory, I got pallets of metal and steel and aluminum and rubber and some other glass and stuff like that. Those are the direct materials. The metal, the steel, the aluminum. Those are all direct materials to make a car. I take those direct materials, I put them on the assembly line, and it goes down the line. And ultimately, at the end of the assembly line, it becomes a car. And it gets driven off the line. Along that process, People are directly touching that car and putting it together. That's direct material. Uh, sorry, direct labor. I can trace that labor to those cars directly. So those are direct costs. Any questions on direct costs? Are we good so far? You're all still awake. I'm not on mute. You can hear me. Good, yes, thumbs up maybe. Tell me you're awake at least. Okay. All right, there we go. Celine's awake. Okay, good, good news. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, the next cost that we need to talk about classification of costs is indirect costs. 
these are costs that we cannot trace to the manufacturing of a single product. Or it's way too difficult to do it. Examples. Indirect materials. Factory overhead. Office supplies. <laughs> Maintenance of the building. The supervisor's salaries. Okay. I said a few things there. Indirect materials. Indirect materials are materials used in the manufacturing process that do not make up the majority cost of the product. Example, in making this cell phone, the small, uh, what do you call these things? It's a button, I know that part, but there's like a, a ring, okay, that goes around the button. And it's it's a little bit of rubber, okay? Very little bit of rubber. Like you would barely know it's there. It's that small, right? So that little bit of rubber is called an indirect material. The reason for that is because it does not make up a very large percentage of the total cost of the materials. It's a very small percentage of the material that we use in the manufacturing process. Therefore, we call it an indirect cost. It makes up a very small amount of the cost of the product. It is an indirect cost, the rubber to make the phone. Another example, the car. We talked about making the car. I got my steel, my aluminum, uh, my precious metals, etc., to make the car. That stuff makes up the majority of the cost. Those are direct costs. But I also have uh, a little what we call um, cobalt. Cobalt is this precious metal that is used in making catalytic converters. Okay. The cobalt inside the catalytic converters makes up a very small amount of materials. That's an indirect material. It makes up a very small amount. Make sense? Other indirect costs include the supervisor's salary. Okay. The supervisor oversees. Okay, the people on the assembly line, that's the supervisor. The supervisor is not building the car with the people on the line. The supervisor's watching. The supervisor's watching, supervising. Watching the people making the car on the assembly line, the supervisor, okay? I cannot directly trace the supervisor's salary to the manufacturing of the cars. Therefore, the supervisor's salary is an indirect cost. The maintenance people that clean the area on the assembly line, indirect cost. They're not making the car. They're just making sure that the line is running. Okay. Uh, the uh, maintenance of the machines that help to build the car, indirect cost. The machines are not making the car. Humans are. Okay. So maintaining the machines, indirect cost. Those are just a few examples of indirect cost. Make sense? Good, right? Okay. Thank you, thank you. Okay, now that we know direct cost, indirect cost, and we know fixed costs and variable costs, let's talk about how they impact the financial statements. To make a product, any product, I don't care what product it is. It could be anything. To manufacture something, a product, 
There are three costs associated with making a product. Direct labor, the employees making the physical product, touching and making the physical product. Direct labor, direct materials that make up the majority of the cost of manufacturing that product. And manufacturing overhead. Manufacturing overhead includes things like utilities, includes things like maintenance, supervisor salary, rent. It's all manufacturing overhead. You know, it's all that, it's all that extra stuff that we can't trace. Manufacturing overhead. The way that we apply the cost of manufacturing overhead to a product depends on the method that we use to apply that cost. And there's a couple of different methods, and we'll talk about that over the next few weeks. But direct labor, direct material, and manufacturing overhead are the three costs that go into making a single product. Now there are additional costs. Because we know direct material, direct labor, factory overhead, that's to make the product. I also got to sell it. <laughs> got to sell the product. It costs me money to sell it too. Right? It's their cost associated with selling it. There are costs associated with delivering the product to the customer. There are costs associated from the support office and administration. We call these selling and administrative expenses. And selling and administrative expenses, we call these period costs because they are not directly associated with the product cost but they're related to selling the product. Therefore, we call them period costs. The difference is a product cost is the cost of just simply making the product. The period costs go on the income statement as expenses during the period that we sell the product or manufacture the product. That's the difference. Here's a nice flow chart to show you how it looks. Product costs, the one in gray there at the bottom. Product costs, those become what we call inventory. Remember, when a product is finished, it becomes finished goods. Okay, here's inventory. Here's how inventory works. The car example. I talked about raw steel raw aluminum, raw metal. Those are raw materials. They're sitting out in a warehouse ready to be used. They haven't been used yet, but they're ready to be used to start making the car. <laughs> those are called raw materials. And I have those in my raw materials inventory. When I am ready to start making the cars, I take those out of raw materials inventory and I put them into what we call work in process. Work in process means we started to make the car. It's a work in process, right? I'm making the car. It is a work in process. When I'm done making the car at the end of the assembly line, I take it out of work in process and I put it into finished goods inventory. Those are the three different types of inventory that we talk about in this course, raw materials, work in process, and finished goods. They all belong to the product. Now on the other side we have the period costs. Those are your selling and administrative expenses. They just go on in the income statement as expenses, okay? When I sell 
the inventory, the finished goods. It, as you remember, we take it out of finished goods and it goes on to our income statement as revenue and cost of goods sold, right? The cost of goods sold is the cost of the finished good when we sell it. That's why we call it cost of goods sold. Nice little flow chart, I kind of like. This is a nice uh, chart to help you identify and understand if it's a fixed or variable cost, if it's direct or indirect material, and if it's a product cost or a period cost. Remember, it's a fixed cost if it's a cost that does not change over time. Fixed costs are costs that do not change over time. Variable costs change with the level of output, or based off the level of activity. Direct costs are costs that I can trace directly to the manufacturing of a product. Indirect costs are costs I cannot directly trace to the manufacturing of a product. Product costs are costs associated with making the product. Period costs are selling and administrative expenses that are related to the sale of the product. It's income statement expense. It's good name. Doing okay. Very good. Okay. You can apply this same concept to service companies. Now, of course, in this course, we're going to be of course, in this course, right? It's funny. Uh, in this course, we're going to be talking primarily about manufacturing companies. But you can apply these same concepts to service companies like airlines uh, uh, and other services, right? Airlines, dentists, lawyers, etc. You could apply the same concepts. Uh, for example, in an airline, the beverage costs are associated with the number of passengers on the plane. It's a variable cost associated with the number of passengers. That's just an example of how you can apply uh, food and beverage costs to a service company. It's based off the number of passengers. In a hotel, it's based on the number of guests. When we're making a product, this is the breakdown of the cost of making a product. 45% of the product is direct materials. 15% is direct labor, 40% is factory overhead. On average, this is typically how it looks. Typically how it looks. Not always this way, but it's usually pretty close. Direct materials, as I had said, are materials that we taste, trace directly to the manufacturing of a product. For a car, in my car example, I have steel, aluminum, metal. Those are direct materials. They make up the majority of the cost of manufacturing the car. And I can trace exactly the amounts of the quantities of each raw material I use to each car. That's direct materials. Direct labor, these are the employees wages that are assembling the car on the assembly line. They're physically touching the product, they're physically molding the car together. That's direct labor. They're directly touching the car. They're directly involved. I can trace the cost based off of their hourly wages times the number of hours worked on that specific car. 
That's how I can trace direct lead. And I can, of course, trace factory overhead. Factory overhead, as we as we talked about, include things like indirect labor, indirect materials, supervisors, salaries, utility expenses, etc. These are related to the manufacturing but cannot directly be traced. Therefore, we apply it separately. Two more types of costs I want to explain to you. We have what's called prime costs and conversion. Prime means first, yeah? Prime, number one, prime. Prime. Prime time, number one. Prime costs are costs that primarily make up the majority of the product primarily prime conversion costs are costs that can be converted and applied to the manufacturing process and i'll show you what those look like And of course, there's also non-manufacturing costs. These are costs that simply go on the income statement as expenses when they happen. We also have the period costs, which are selling administrative expenses. And those simply get applied to as expenses on the income statement. On uh, the balance sheet. On the balance sheet, as a manufacturer, it's on the right side. On the balance sheet, we have raw materials inventory, work and process inventory, and finished goods inventory. That's a, what a manufacturer has on their inventory uh, uh, on the balance sheet. A merchandiser also known as a retailer, just has finished goods because they buy and sell finished goods. That's all they get. They're not going to have work in process or raw materials. They're a retailer. They just sell finished goods. So on their balance sheet under inventory, you'll just see finished goods. Raw materials. These are materials that we have not yet processed. They're waiting, they're out in the yard. My, for my car example, I have my steel, my aluminum, uh, my metal, it's all waiting. It's waiting to go onto the assembly line. It's called raw materials. Okay, we haven't processed it yet, it's raw materials. Work in process is when I'm taking the raw material, putting it into work in process, and my employees are physically making the car. They're in process of making the car. That's why we call it work in process. I'm using that material and labor to make the product. It's work in process. When they're done making the car, it becomes finished goods. It's done, okay? They're done making the car. It's finished goods, and I can now sell that car. Go ahead and sell it. It's, I'm pushing it out onto the parking lot. Go ahead and move that onto a truck and get it on out of here. It's finished goods inventory. It's completed. It's ready for sale. Finished goods. That's the difference between the three raw materials, working process, finished goods. Raw materials, I haven't touched it yet. It's, it's still sitting out there. Working process, I'm working on building the carts on the assembly line. My employees are molding the car together finished goods the car is done rolling it out into the parking lot finished goods ready for sale but you'll see all three inventories categories on the balance sheet for a manufacturer for a merchandiser 
also known as a retailer, you'll just see finished goods or merchandise inventory, whatever you want to call it. And for a service company like an airline over here on the left, you won't see inventory. They don't carry inventory. You know, it's a service. Service companies don't have inventory. Retailers, they have finished goods inventory, it's also known as merchandise inventory. And of course, your manufacturers have raw materials, working process, and finished goods inventory categories. So that's typically how their balance sheets look under assets. Okay. Let's talk about cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold, as you remember from principles of accounting one, is the cost of the inventory that we sold. Cost of goods sold. It's the cost of the inventory that we sold. Hopefully we sold it for more than the cost of the inventory, right? But the cost of goods sold represents the cost of acquiring that inventory for, for a, a merchandiser or a retailer. We take beginning balance merchandise inventory plus purchases of additional inventory minus the ending merchandise inventory equals cost of goods sold. That's how much I sold right, throughout that period. For a manufacturer, we take the beginning finished goods inventory plus the cost of goods manufactured minus ending finished goods inventory. Now here's the difference. It's this one right here. It's called cost of goods manufactured. Cost of goods manufactured. That includes your uh, uh, direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead. Direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead. Those are the costs of making a product, those are product costs. And those product costs total all together the cost of goods manufactured. So when you think of cost of goods manufactured, think product costs. And all that defined cost of goods sold. Uh, for a retailer, here in the top left, cost of goods sold, how's it calculated? We take beginning merchandise inventory plus cost of inventory purchased equals goods available for sale minus ending inventory equals cost of goods sold. For a manufacturer, it's beginning finished goods inventory plus the cost of goods manufactured equals inventory available for sale minus ending finished goods inventory equals cost of goods sold. It's just a matter of understanding the difference between cost of goods purchased and cost of goods manufactured. That's really the only difference that you need to understand. To find cost of goods sold. This one's good. I like this. You can really understand costs when you understand the physical flow. And that's why I use the example of manufacturing a car on the assembly line. Because we can visualize 
the flow of the car down the assembly line. The materials start out in the yard as raw steel, raw aluminum, raw metal. Those are all my raw materials. Okay? And when I need more of those, I purchase more of those from my suppliers. Okay? That's raw materials. It's all raw materials. Now, the assembly line, they'll fill out this form. The form is called a requisition form. A requisition form, it basically is an internal form that is sent from one department to another to say, hey, I need those raw materials. Here's how many I need. Here's the quantity of each one that I need to make this particular car. Mike. Hello, sir. Hey, how you doing? Doing all right. Apologies for coming late work and I had to help my mom out with some stuff, but I'm here. I understand. I appreciate you being here, sir. All right. As always, Mike, if you have any questions along the way, just feel free to unmute your microphone and ask your question as always. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. So we take raw materials out of raw materials, but into work in process using the requisition form. Tells you how many, how much quantity, the cost of each material, and then we take the raw materials out of raw materials and put it into work in process. And then it hits the assembly line and we begin the work. The car moves down the assembly line. We're using the raw materials to make the car work in process. We're adding direct labor. Those are the employees that are making the car as it moves down the assembly line. We're adding in factory overhead. I got lights on, I got you, you know, you, the utilities are running. I got the, the maintenance is helping me out, et cetera. The factory overhead, you know what I'm talking about. So I add that into the working process. And then when the car moves down the assembly line further, 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 I get to the end of the assembly line. The car rolls off the assembly line and becomes a finished good. So I add up my direct materials, direct labor, and finished goods. I'm sorry, direct material, direct labor, factory overhead. I add those three things together to equal my finished goods. Okay, that's the cost of a product is direct material, direct labor, factory overhead. We add those three costs together to get the cost of goods manufactured, which is finished goods inventory. And then, of course, when I sell that car, it becomes cost of goods sold. It goes on to my income statements, cost of goods sold. Questions? It makes sense, right? Just think about the physical flow. You can track all of your costs at each step, thinking about the physical flow of the inventory. Best way to think about it. Okay. Let's talk about cost of goods manufactured. Cost of goods manufactured, as you know, are the direct materials plus the direct labor plus the factory overhead. Those are my total manufacturing costs. That's what uh, the total cost of make, making a product is direct material, direct labor, factory overhead. I'm going to add in the beginning work and process balance. I'm going to subtract my ending work and process balance to equal the cost of goods manufactured. What this amount tells me is the total amount of cost of goods manufactured, including what's currently uh, in work in process at the time, 
and the total um, amount that has already been completed. So we call it cost of goods manufactured. In manufacturing, we have this thing called a manufacturing statement. And it shows me the direct materials used, the direct labor used, and all of the factory overhead used. Like an itemized list, right? And it shows me the direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead all broken out. So looking at this, we see my direct materials balances, raw materials, and inventory plus purchases equals materials available for use minus uh, the materials ending inventory equals materials used plus direct labor direct labor you get that from the hourly wages of the employees directly working on the product time uh, up the hourly rate times number of hours worked on the product you get direct labor cost then we have our factory overhead remember factory overhead are things that we cannot directly trace to the product but are used in the manufacturing process like indirect labor the factory supervisor salary rent uh, the utilities uh, repairs and maintenance, property taxes, et cetera. You know, all of the overhead stuff. So we add all that together to get our total manufacturing costs. Direct material plus direct labor plus total factory overhead is total manufacturing costs. Then we add in work and process inventory. Uh, and then we subtract out the uh, ending work and process inventory to get our total cost of goods manufactured. It's a lot, but you, you know, remember, this is managerial accounting. So we're looking at these kind of reports. The, the uh, managers use these kind of reports to make decisions about things like controlling the cost of overhead, controlling materials cost, et cetera. That's what that's where these come in, come in play. We talked we talked I kind of went through all of that just now. <laughs> I forgot that they, it breaks it down even further. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> I want to show you how the cost of goods manufactured flows into the income statement as cost of goods manufactured under cost of goods sold. You know, it's broken out, cost of goods manufactured, cost of goods sold. And I also want you to, to see how the ending work and process balance from the cost of goods manufactured report flows into the balance sheet as work in process inventory. Remember, work in process, it's still inventory. It's it's the all of the direct the direct raw materials that I'm working on currently. And then I also want you to see how the ending finished goods on the income statement flows into the finished goods inventory on the balance sheet. So remember, just like we talked about the principles of accounting one, the financial statements are linked together through common elements. And this kind of just shows you how all that flows across the reports. So throughout the next, uh, five weeks, six weeks, we'll continue our discussion on managerial accounting, which is what this course focuses on. I want you to think about this course from a manufacturing perspective, because we will talk a lot about various costs 
and how all those costs work. And I want you to think about how it all comes together in business through things like customer orientation, how do things look to the customer, uh, internet sales, the use of lean practices, the concept of a global economy, what does it mean to be able to sell across borders easily? Uh, the service economy, what does it mean? What is the service economy? How does it support the business? And what is the value chain? These are trends in, in measure accounting. And uh, it's important to understand how these interface with manufacturing. One thing you'll hear me talk a lot about is the word lean. What does it mean to be lean? When you hear when you hear the word lean, what does it what does it mean to you? What do you think? What does it mean to be lean? L e a n. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, when I hear lean, I uh, assume they're trying to lean a customer into buying said product or investing in a product or an idea. That's one way of thinking about it. Yes, um, that's that's one good definition too, especially when we talk about sales. You're right on that part. Think about what does it mean to be lean from a manufacturing perspective? Like, let's say we're making the product. What does it mean to be lean? What do you think? We got the sales part down. What about manufacturing? What does it mean to be lean? I'm going to guess manufacturing, I guess, possibly leaning into trends or leaning into new technologies and trying to keep up with your competition, I believe. Or leaning into, yeah, I'll go with my first my first answer. Plus, leaning into new, using to new technologies, using new marketing um, ideas or uh, yeah. techniques to you know get your product selling and get your product out there. There we go. Exactly. Yeah. No, no you're absolutely right. Especially from a orient, customer orientation perspective, that is absolutely correct. And we can look at these in a couple of different ways, but yes, uh, from a customer orientation perspective, most definitely that all of those answers are correct. Um, I will also say from a cost perspective, or from a uh, quality and cost perspective, the word lean, and especially in lean manufacturing, means to eliminate waste. So if, if you think about like a, when you're making a car, for example, I've been using, using that example all day. When you're making a, a car on an assembly line, lean manufacturing means I'm not going to waste any material. I'm going to use as much material as possible. That's, that's lean, right? You're using as much of the material as possible. You're focusing on the quality. Uh, uh, that's, that's lean manufacturing. We'll talk more about that later on as well. So many different uh, concepts to cover. Uh, so in manufacturing, we, we focus a lot on standards, how to improve uh, our company, our, our product, how to improve the quality of the product. We also look at the business as a whole. How do I maintain a good quality focus on high standards? Um, all of these things are really important. We train our employees to think about the core values of the company. We, th we think about, uh, what, what kind of value proposition we have for our customers. We think about, uh, just ways to continuously improve. Uh, all of these are trends in accounting. One thing, oh, and this one, this one's actually one of my favorite topics in uh, in current managerial accounting. It's called just in time manufacturing. This was uh, created by the Japanese uh, hundreds of years ago. They created what they call just in time manufacturing. Uh, it's called the Kiritsu system in Japan, and the way it works is. They would create the product for the customer. 
like a, what do you call like a special order okay they receive the order they schedule the production they get the raw materials in just in time for the production so there's no like warehouse with thousands of parts sitting around somewhere no 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 there's no need for that when you get the customer order then you order the parts from your vendor you receive the parts just in time to make the product for the customer you assemble everything just in time and then you deliver it when the customer needs it okay that's called just in time there's no waste you don't have millions of parts sitting in a warehouse that are just not being used right here's the difference uh toyota uh is a, a japanese car manufacturer i'm sure you're all aware of the brand they've been around for a long time uh they use the just-in-time manufacturing process that's why when you go to a toyota dealership you won't see a whole lot of cars sitting on the lot they don't make them that way they make them based off of the customer's orders right and so uh that's why you go to toyota there's not a lot of cars sitting on a lot they use just-in-time manufacturing if you go to chevrolet or uh, general motors they got thousands of cars sitting on the lot okay pick your color uh, whatever's out there whatever whatever right tons of cars they're all the same right they do not use just-in-time manufacturing they they use what we call uh mass production and we'll talk a little bit about that as well but just in times of a great concept it doesn't work for all companies but it does work for those with specialized kind of kind of uh, manufacturing. They're specialized. The value chain. I, I like talking about this because it has it's directly related to the supply chain. Right. Uh, as you all have seen throughout the past year or two, we've been dealing with what we call supply chain constra constraints. And the reason for this is because the supply chain is uh, not always perfect. And when there's fluctuations in demand, there are fluctuations in the supply chain. And so uh, a part of the chain sometimes might get severed or might break. So for example, uh, right now, we're experiencing supply chain issues with a couple of different things, right? Currently in 2022, uh, in this summer, spring, summer, we have the baby formula crisis, okay? The United States experienced a, a massive recall by one company that manufactures most of the baby formula here in the United States. And uh, the recall was due to an issue with some of the raw materials used in the formula. Now, uh, what happened is there was a decrease in demand for the baby formula throughout the pandemic. And so these manufacturers slowed down the process and uh, a lot of the raw materials set. And then the demand increased back up as things were get, kind of getting back to somewhat normal. And and then there you go. Like it creates like a, a wave or a chain rate of what I would call a chain reaction. And so it caused problems with getting raw materials. It caused problems in, in the uh, manufacturing process. And then through the supply chain it goes, right? And so... Uh, uh, that, that's like a common situation with supply chain, but the value chain is related to supply chain. In the manufacturing process, we take the raw materials, we turn it into a work in process, it becomes a finished good. At every step of the process, we're adding value to the product, uh, which is the whole concept behind the manufacturing. 
but the supply chain it's, and the value chain are relatively related because at every step of the process, uh, there's a flow of product and inf information. Uh, and that's, you know, one of the things we talked about earlier was like the globalization when we sell globally, right? Uh, the supply, the current supply chain issues has to do with the over reliance of international partners. Um, and that's what's one of the other constraints that we're experiencing right now. But there, it's it just it's a very interesting um, topic to to do some research on and to kind of really understand of why we're having shortages of certain things and why you know the, why costs are going out of control for certain things. There, there's just so many dynamics at play to really understand, and it's just, it's, it, it's just interesting in my opinion. Uh, okay, so we talked a little bit about the lean uh, processes and what it means to be lean. Uh, I always look at lean, when you hear the word lean, think reduce waste. You know, make it make it lean, right? Make it lean, reduce waste, uh, make it more efficient. Uh, 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 and I also like Mike's uh, concept about leaning into the customer for sales and service and et cetera. Yeah, all great products. Yeah, uh, yeah, you get this. Yeah, Celine, we're spot on. Uh, we're also experiencing lean like meat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, tr they say trim the fat, right? That's uh, very common. Like when you, if you go to a butcher or uh, you go to the grocery store, you'll see, uh, for those of you who eat meat, you'll see on the package, it'll say 90, 85% lean, 90% lean, so forth, so on, right? Uh, these are... Uh, are they eliminate waste from the animal, which is how what makes them lean, right? The waste meaning the fat and the meat. Yeah, that's that's a good one, Celine. That's a that's a very good analogy. There's also a a, a drive for companies to be socially responsible and to report socially responsible activities on their financial statements in the notes. Uh, example, right now there's a really big push for companies to report the amount of carbon dioxide that they're releasing into the air uh, by the ton, okay? And the reason for this is because uh, they are trying to account for the amount of waste that companies are uh, polluting the air uh, for with carbon dioxide to understand the impact of climate change and to have um, an understanding of the cost associated with climate change and to have that cost allocated based off of the tons of dioxide released into the air by the manufacturing facilities. So it's a very interesting topic. Uh, it's a very up and coming uh, area in, uh, right now. So it's, there's there's some legislation being written around it, and I, I think we'll see something in the next few years about a requirement to the financial statements for that to be included. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. Now. Just as we talked about in the last chapter, uh, inventory turnover as a measurement of profitability, we also have, we can do the same inventory turnover process uh, using ratios for raw materials, work and process and finished goods. We take, for example, for raw materials, we take raw materials used divided by average materials inventory. As you recall from the last chapter, we to find the average, we take beginning balance plus ending balance divided by two to find the average. Uh, yeah, so that's a good ratio to understand 
how quickly we're using our raw materials to make sure they're not sitting in the yard too long. And we can also use day sales inventory for raw materials. And this, this also tells me it's another measurement that we can use how many days that the material has been sitting there for in raw materials. We take ending raw materials inventory divided by raw materials used times 365 days to find how many days it's been sitting there. That, my friends, is the end of our discussion of managerial accounting, uh, introducing you to the concepts of managerial accounting. Uh, any questions so far? We're doing okay. All good. Okay. Uh, I want to recap what just happened uh, over the past two hours. <clears throat> Two and a half hours. We talked about the syllabus. If you haven't had the chance, please make sure you look at the syllabus. Uh, click on start here and review the syllabus. Why is it important? Because you need to understand how the course is laid out, what the percent weight uh, is for each assignment. It's very similar to the way that I taught principles of accounting one. It's designed, this, the course is designed the same way. We have, everything's modular. So you have modules one, two, and three. Each module has two weeks in there. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Remember, this is a six-week course, not an eight-week course. It's a six-week course. Every week, we cover two chapters. Or, you know, we'll at least hit. So, which means you have two things to do every week, okay? In this first week, which we're just wrapped up, uh, we have Chapter 17 Discussion Board and the Chapter 18 Quiz. Both of these are due this Sunday night, which is July 10th. Uh, for the Discussion Board, Chapter 17, if you missed the lecture, please watch the video. Uh, the discussion is between vertical and horizontal analysis. Use outside resources, citations, and references, please, in your discussion posts. Every discussion post must be a few full paragraphs, okay? Full paragraphs. We're talking like six to seven to eight sentences. That's a full paragraph, yeah. Uh, so full paragraphs with citations and references for your initial post. You also need to respond to two or more of your classmates with full paragraphs. Don't just be like, good job, nice work, da, da, da. You know that doesn't work with me. So please make sure that they're full paragraph responses to your classmates as well. So in other words, you got to write three different paragraphs, three different posts, yeah? Uh, in order to gain full credit for this discussion board. The rubric for the discussion board is right here. It shows you how you'll be graded. Yeah, I'm very transparent. You guys know me. So I, uh, I always shoot for the excellent category. So how's it going to be excellent? Comprehension, full paragraphs, logical, organized. It's on time. You, you responded to two or more of your classmates with full paragraphs. And you use proper grammar, spelling, citations, etc. That will get you the full 10 points. Yes, this first one is worth 10 points. It's a full letter grade, by the way. You know I don't do curves. You don't. You know I don't do extra credit. Uh, it's 10 points. Yeah. Celine, please. You have a question. Uh, yes, professor. I had a. I have a question. So last, if you remember, um, for. The last accounting one, we used to meet like only once a week. Are we going to be meeting like the two days, Monday and Wednesday? Uh, no, just it, it, normally it'll just be on Mondays. Okay. So, yeah, we, we didn't meet this past Monday because it was holiday. So, uh, so we meet today and then uh, for the future weeks, it'll just be on Monday. And the reason again, just like before, uh, I make sure that you have time 
during the week on a Wednesday to do the work for this course. So on Wednesdays, Wednesday night specifically from 5.30 to 8.50, that's a good time for you to work on this course, okay? I'll be around. You can always ask me questions. Uh, but I would like you to use that class time to complete the work for that respective week. Because remember, there's two things every single week in this course. I don't want you to get behind. This course is going to go by very, very fast. Remember, it's only six weeks. That's a lot of stuff in six weeks. Two chapters every week. Oh, my goodness. That's going to go by so fast. Okay, so use that time to do the work. Good question, Celine. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, so the discussion, do Sunday night. Make sure that you do the original post and then respond to two of your classmates. All of that's due Sunday night. Also Sunday night, you have the Chapter 18 quiz. That's on the stuff we just talked about just now. So Chapter 18 quiz, and it's, again, this is designed the same way. So quizzes and homework assignments. Five questions each, thereabouts. Uh, you have two attempts on each homework assignment and each quiz. Two attempts on each homework assignment and each quiz. I will accept the higher grade of the two in the grade book. Each quiz and homework assignment is worth Ten point, uh, I'm sorry, five points each. But don't miss any points. Make sure you do all the work and do it on time, please. Because I tell you, this class goes so fast, you cannot fall behind in this one. It's only six weeks. And then next week, we'll do two chapters, 19 and 20. Uh, oh, oh, also, I need to mention this. You'll notice... In almost every chapter, except for this first one, in 18, chapter 18, you see this one. It says chapter 18 exercises. Exercises are just for your practice, okay, for you to practice. Remember, accounting is a practice. I've said that to you before. I'll say it again. Accounting is a practice. The best way for you to learn accounting is to practice it. And so I created these exercises for each week, for each chapter, okay? These are, you don't have to turn these in to me. They're just there for you to practice them, yeah? I, I remember back in the spring, I asked you guys to, to complete the survey. Remember the survey? And I use, like I said, I take what you all say very seriously, okay? So uh, a lot of you asked me, Dr. B, I want to see more examples. I want to see more practice, uh, more opportunity to practice. That's what these exercises are here for you. Okay, so feel free to download those, go through them, exercise. They're, they're exercises. They're not graded. They're just there to help you to practice and understand the content. And there's uh, that exists for pretty much every chapter. Questions? We're good. Okay. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, my friends, uh, with that, please make sure that you complete your Chapter 17 discussion, Chapter 18 quiz by this Sunday night. Please, 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 don't waste any time. Get started right away. Um, if you have yeah. uh, you good, Mike? Yeah, no, I just said will do. I'll make sure. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns along the way, you know you can email me, you can call me, you can set up office hours with me. The link's right here in the classroom. If, uh, and as always, I want you to stay safe, wash your hands, <laughs> do the right things. I will see you all again on Monday, 5.30 p.m., the same link, WebEx link in the classroom, 5.30 p.m. on Monday. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your evening. I appreciate all of you. So happy to see all of you again. You know how I missed you guys so much. And I'll see you all again on Monday. Thank you so much for your time today. 
appreciate all of you. Have a wonderful night.